Good evening. Good evening. Well, so this is what the new establishment looks like. I know that because I read it in the Observer at the weekend, it must be true. It used to be that the old establishment read the Spectator, now we are told they read Prospect magazine. So you, whether you know it or like it or not, assuming you read Prospect magazine, of course, are the new establishment. Wonderful, you can smell the power from here. If only Alistair Campbell were in the audience, our cup would run over. I have a, a sort of small apology to make. We had hoped that tonight would be a sort of really fierce knock em down, drag em out, no prisoners taken, no quarter asked or given, punch up. Sadly, the leadership of the Conservative Party couldn't make it. <laughs> so you got this two instead. The Hitchens brothers. The, uh, the important thing, I think, is that um, there is a brilliant new book uh, to, to form the, uh, the, the heart of, uh, of our debate tonight, scintillatingly controversial, daringly provocative, superbly written, uh, an intellectual tour de force that's already beginning uh, to change the way we all live our lives. But uh, enough of my book, um, we should... Uh... <laughs> just for a minute you thought they didn't knew it, Chins. Just not for a, just not not for a second. second, no, no. It didn't, it didn't fool me either. <laughs> no, it didn't fool me, no, no. Well, I thought it was worth a try. They're on sale outside, all of them are on sale outside. Very few of mine are left, unfortunately, so only the first few will... Uh, yeah, it's true, it's true. Yeah. So there's the rare unsigned. <laughs> Thank you, yeah, yeah. The... Is that going to be the standard, though? Because I have to say that that is... Uh... Right, you'll know our two combatants, Peter and... Combatants, yeah, I suppose, Peter and Christopher Hitchens. Brothers united in their total disagreement on every single political... Is that a mobile phone already? Kill, kill. Whoever did it, kill immediately. Um, rather than me tell you about them, because you know about them, I'll let you tell, or them tell you about each other, just with a, with a couple of quotes from them. This is, uh, this is Peter on Christopher. If there is anything worse than a young conservative, it is an old reactionary. The Western world is infested with paunchy radicals. Mm. And this is him on him, uh, whether or not he becomes the new Enoch Powell of our stricken nation, he, he has at least buggered up Michael Portillo. <laughs> Which is a better day's work than I can claim to have done lately. But we have of course only a word for that, don't we? Uh, a, a, a little list I asked to one of them, uh, Peter, to give me a little list about the issues that divide them most sharply, and, uh, and, and here it is, uh, the United Kingdom, the European Union, the Irish question, the monarchy, religion as the basis for morality, the close or special relationship between Britain and the United States, which I think you will agree does not leave very much. And what we're going to do uh, in, in uh, uh, an hour or so this evening, a bit more than an hour I hope, is, uh, is, is, well, you've seen what's on the, uh, on the invitation, on the ticket, let's abolish Britain. He has, in fact, Mr. Hitchens here, Peter, has, uh, as you will know, written a book to that effect and uh, about that subject. And he's going to talk about it the, um, and tell you why he thinks it's a good idea, um, or not as the case may be. The, the format is pretty straightforward. Peter's going to talk for less than 20 minutes to tell you uh, the, the essence of his argument. He will then be cross-examined by Christopher for a few minutes. Christopher will then deliver his own uh, 10 minutes or so. He will then be cross-examined by him for a few minutes and then you will all pile in. The only thing I would ask you when you all pile in is let's try and keep to sort of subject by subject rather than drift all over the place all the time. So we'll, I'm not going to get involved, well at least as little as possible. It's, it's down to you to do the work this evening. Um, so, but let's try and keep a, a, a not, not necessarily order in the sense of I don't mind if you heckle or shout. Indeed, if you heckle and shout, that's absolutely fine. <laughs> not bad, not bad. Can you get rid of him immediately? Right. Peter. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, and of course, comrades. <laughs> there, there always used to be comrades, and here in Conway Hall there are certainly plenty 
of ghostly comrades unable to tear themselves away from the earthly struggle, soup-stained, bearded characters haunting the place which they used to inhabit when they were alive. Actually, people up there are alive. Um, what can I say? Uh, the other thing I would like to say about this meeting this evening is that it's totally unlike the launch of Britain in Europe, at which it was announced that it was patriotic to want to abolish your own country. Everybody has been allowed in. There was no list of people, as there was at that event, who were to be excluded on the grounds that they had the wrong opinions, a sign of the direction in which our country is moving, and rather a serious one. I'd also like to make an announcement. Any of you who are feeling cold should blame the Evening Standard and Times newspapers, which have jointly spread the vile calumny that I am opposed to central heating, thus encouraging the management, the economically minded management of the Conway Hall to switch off theirs. Thanks to another misunderstanding about my attitude to food, gristle canapes, cold, greasy mutton sandwiches, slabs of suet pudding with cool custard on, and thick white cups of very strong brown tea will be served at the end of the meeting. <laughs> they are compulsory, just as such things were in my young day at a strict regime boarding school on the edge of Dartmoor. Count yourself lucky there's no lukewarm free school milk as well, thanks to Mrs. Thatcher. Some of you may wonder why we have decided to hold this debate. Well, first of all, we needed to quash once and for all some damaging rumors about us. We were, it was alleged, never seen together in public. We were both corpulent and spoke in the same plummy baritone. Neither of us seemed capable of doing up our top shirt buttons, so exposing alarmingly similar hairy chests, and we could impersonate each other on the telephone. Could it be, asked the cynics, that we were really one and the same person having an elaborate joke? Now this idea was, of course, unbearable to both of us, and after an emergency summit in which we drew lots for the harder task, I embarked on a diet composed mainly of kippers and cabbage and became less fat, and the strategy would have succeeded had not Christopher ruined everything by writing what appeared to be an attack on that liberal hero, Bill Clinton, making some people think that he was right-wing. There were even suggestions that he might be about to launch an attack on the sacred Nelson Mandela, like the one which he had already made on poor old Mother Teresa. And so this suggestion that we were the same person must be quashed, and we are, as you can see and bear witness, both here in the flesh, more in his case than mine, and, and at once. I and, could have said that. And we disagree profoundly on the great central issues of our times, which we are here tonight to debate, with perhaps a little girthism thrown in from time to time. Now, my brother doesn't like Britain. That is to say, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. He thinks that surrendering, surrendering the Irish portion of our country to the IRA is more or less a good move. He proclaims loudly that he is a citizen of something called the European Union. He expresses an enthusiasm for Tom Paine, as if this country was still ruled by Hanoverian kings and their placemen. In this he is at least open and honest about his intentions and his views. Our current government, which in an illiterate and clumsy way shares his goals and views, do not have either the courage or the honesty to say so. They smile and they lie, rather than admit to being the destructive radicals they actually are. They don't like Britain because they don't feel comfortable in it. The brighter of them don't like Britain because it makes nonsense of every radical and socialist political theory ever invented. It is a monarchy, yet it is free. It has a, pot a potent class system, yet all may rise to the top of it. It has no written constitution, yet functions far better than many countries which do. It is capitalist, yet astonishingly uncorrupt and blessed with a social conscience. It was an empire, yet is not hated by most of its former subjects. In a socialist world, it simply oughtn't to exist. But rather than abandon the secular religion of socialism, the British left, in their classically idealist way, would prefer to abolish the country that so defies their worldview by the mere act of existing. And now, after two centuries in which the fact and idea of Britain seemed all but indestructible, their opportunity has come. And this, I believe, explains my brother's willingness to be in the same room as Princess Tony Blair and sometimes say <laughs> nice things about him, even though the princess is exactly the kind of empty, empty witless creep that Christopher would normally avoid at all costs. <laughs> so much of it. 
<laughs> the title of this debate, Let's Abolish Britain, is of course not my view, but it seems to me to sum up the jaunty and almost careless way in which the left, and especially Christopher, view the demolition of our country. And I've just touched on the origins of this strange desire, but first I'd like to make a small personal point in answer to so many questions. How is it, some of you may ask, that the two of us should take such fiercely opposed positions when we are brothers? All kinds of explanations occur. Many of them are sub Freudian drivel of the sort resorted to by, by people when they don't like someone or can't understand what they say and cannot imagine that their actions or their thoughts have any good or decent motives. The truth is that we, though definitely not the same person, do have something very important in common. We both have independence of mind. Who knows why? Our unlikely but actually very British ancestry West Country nonconformists on one side, Jewish refugees from Prussian militarism on the other, and heaven knows what else beyond, though no Iroquois as far as I know, <coughs> may offer a clue. The independent mind instinctively revolts against conformism, whether imposed by fashion, as ours is, or naked authority, as it probably eventually will be again if things carry on going as they are. Nor are two independent minds necessarily going to be attracted by the same ideas although they are likely to be repelled quite frequently by the dishonest, the conformist, and the banal, or so I like to think. We are, in fact, closer than we appear, and closer than we would like to confess. Our shared loathing and contempt for the pitiful clown who occupies the White House, a contempt which long predates the Lewinsky affair, is not an accident, but a sign of a shared dislike for a certain kind of unprincipled fraud which transcends ordinary political positions. It may even be that some of the things I say this evening appeal to some of you on the left, though you wouldn't care to admit it to yourselves or your friends, because if you did, you'd never eat polenta and sun-dried tomatoes in this town again. <laughs> Trained councillors will be available in confidence at the back of the hall after the meeting for anyone who suffers any such qualms, and you'll be able to identify them by the baseball caps. And now to Britain and its abolition only a few years off, unless I can stop it with or without the aid of the Kensington and Chelsea Conservative Association. There used to be in our house, during our childhood, a thin book containing a longish poem by an American, Alice Dewar Miller, called The White Cliffs. It was popular here and in the USA during the early, deadly dangerous years of the Second World War because of its role in reminding Americans of their links with Britain and British people of their links with America. And this was despite the strong resentments which m many Americans felt towards a country they still viewed as snobbish, narrow, and haughty. This is now forgotten. I cannot, alas, find it in any lumber room or garden shed. And only these lines of it remain at all well known. I am American bred. I have seen much to hate here, much to forgive. But in a world where England is finished and dead, I do not wish to live. The point was that England, as Britain, was too readily known then, stood for a certain set of values which were treasured by all free peoples. The country might have, did have its faults, but in spite of them, perhaps even because of some of them, it had been able to give the world ideas, customs, traditions, poetry, liturgy, scripture, understanding, law, reason, tolerance, valor, generosity, and in that year of 1940, hope. Yes, this was the country of the workhouse and the Irish potato famine and the Amritsar massacre. But it was also the country from which had come the ideas which created the United States of America and which had repeatedly sustained freedom against its many enemies. Something similar comes to mind if you read George Orwell's account of his turmoil at the same moment of our history. He, like Alice Stewart Miller, had seen much to hate. In fact, nobody hated the British establishment of its time with more genuine bile than Orwell. And yet, even as he railed against the beetroot-faced hanging judge who symbolized so much of what he thought was wrong about Britain, he recognized that this fearsome and in some ways repulsive character was also utterly incorruptible. And he recognized that this country was, though full of unfairness and division, a family, a family which he believed had the wrong members in control. Writing as Britain waited naked for invasion in the winter of 1940, he was full of utter contempt for his fellows on the left who would not join the national struggle. Thanks to the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of 1939, many British socialists did not join the war effort, and some actively sought to sabotage it. It was his disgust for them which caused him famously to make the remark, which is the key text of my book, 15 Pounds at All, 
leading booksellers. England, he said, is perhaps the only great country whose intellectuals are ashamed of their own nationality. In left-wing circles, it is always felt there is something slightly disgraceful in being an Englishman, and that it is a duty to snigger at every English institution from horse racing to suet puddings. It is a strange fact, but it is unquestionably true that almost any English intellectual would feel more ashamed of standing to attention during God Save the King than of stealing from a poor box. When he wrote those words, the intellectuals were a tiny and unimportant group, lost in the remote world of literature and scholarship. In the decades after the war, when the country was struggling to recover from damage, poverty and disruption, those intellectuals were to enormously increase their influence in the civil service, in parliament, the universities, the schools, but above all in broadcasting. Their strength in these places was partly due to the great expansion of bureaucracy and state education during the war and after it, partly to what I see now as a loss of nerve and a failure of courage on the part of those who used to run this country. For many years, the supposed establishment of ruling class had not really believed in the things which they professed to believe in and which once made our country so unique. They'd sneered in secret at the Christian faith, which they felt was something for the servants, and they thought themselves too clever and sophisticated to be ruled by something as medieval as a monarchy. They despised, in private, faithful lifelong marriage, constancy, and continence. The First World War, meanwhile, had swept away many of those who would have kept faith with the past. These, in all classes, were those who were volunteered first for the battle and who were most swiftly and thoroughly eaten up in the great cannibal meat grinders of Ypres, the Somme, Luce, and Passchendaele. The betrayal of the British common people in 1916 did terrible damage to patriotism and faith. The devastation of the old governing class did similar damage to the strength and self-confidence of the elite. The influence of the intellectuals during the early years of the Second World War was, thank heaven, small, or we should have lost it. But the war itself made these people much more important. And the war had not made them stop despising their own country. Their enthusiasm for the battle only began when Hitler betrayed his great ally, Stalin, and invaded Russia. Retrospectively, they sought to discredit the behavior of conservative patriotic Britain between 1939 and 1941. The fantasy that the left had always taken a strong line on Hitler while the Tories were secretly hoping for an alliance with National Socialism was widely spread and is still widely believed. And people who hold to this view are still surprised to learn the grubby truth that, for instance, in 1934, a year after Hitler came to power, the Labour-supporting Daily Herald denounced the national government's modest white paper setting out the first steps to rearmament as an insult to Germany. That the Labour Party in Parliament voted against the expansion of the Air Force, which just in time led to its equipment with Spitfires and Hurricanes. That Labour in Parliament actually voted against military conscription in April 1939 after the German army had occupied Prague. I mention these facts not to defend Neville Chamberlain or Stanley Baldwin from the charges made against them, that one was fooled by Hitler and that one was too afraid of pacifism on one hand and the treasury on the other to rearm in time. These charges, in my opinion, are proved. I simply want to demolish the, the myth that the left was interested in defending this country for its own sake before 1941. It was already disloyal, and its eventual support for the war would be based on Soviet patriotism, not British. The left had objected to rearmament. Why? Because it claimed to fear that the weapons would be turned on the Soviet Union. Its foreign policy was to seek alliance with that Soviet Union, which would have required appeasement of Stalin instead of appeasement of Hitler. And I don't quite see how buying peace by handing Stalin Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia would have been morally superior to buying it from Hitler by by handing him the Sudetenland or Poland, or frankly, much more reliable. Then something momentous happened. Just as a war for national survival against Republican France destroyed the radical left in Britain's Napoleonic era, a war for the survival of European liberty, a cold war, but a war nonetheless, sent the left scuttling to the margins of politics from the Berlin airlift all the way up to the fall of the Berlin Wall. During the years of the Cold War, serious radical leftism was rightly, in my view, kept away from government power, especially from foreign policy, except that is in the Secret Intelligence Service, where Kim Fildy and a band of others kept the Anglo-Soviet flame of friendship alive and were subsequently apologized for and excused 
by many in the cultural elite who would never even have shared the same postal district with anyone who'd spied for the Nazis. But during this time, the great expansion of the full-time intelligentsia continued. The end of the war was the beginning of the growth of higher education and broadcasting, even taxpayer-funded art, in which the ideas of Bloomsbury, which Orwell had so much despised, flourished. At the same time, the waning powers of British patriotism, once sustained by empire and military success, faded, leaving many vacuums at the top of society. No conspiracy was necessary, and none took place. The new took the place of the demoralized and apparently discredited old. The left came to power in the education industry, in the civil service, in local government, in the arts, in the churches, above all in television. It even came to power in the Conservative Party, which operated for years as the Labour Party with one, well, lung, and is now struggling with itself to recover its principles. During the puzzling double-edged period of Thatcherism, the new establishment were almost visibly enraged that they did not control the government. They ran everything else. Why not that too? Oddly enough, Mrs. Thatcher, for reasons explained in my book, eventually helped them into power. The end of the Cold War gave the left their greatest chance. Suddenly, for the first time in a century, it seemed safe to give the left, the anti-British, republican, intolerant, liberty-disliking Committee of Public Safety left that had been held in check, mainly by working-class patriotism for so long, it gave them true power. This was not the 1945 Labour Party, whose trade union supporters were more British than anybody in this room. It truly was a new Labour Party, a party of Bloomsbury morals against family and tradition, against our national history, against the Northern Irish Protestants, suspicious of the United States, not because of its r radicalism, but because of its conservatism. And above all, it grasped, even if it didn't understand, that the European Union was the foe of the United Kingdom, and that the two could not coexist for long upon the same patch of soil. So they chose, with unerring instinct, to support it. Here was a new anti-British supranational state with which they could fall in love, ruled by an unelected Politburo called the Commission bolstered by a central committee known as the Council of Ministers and adorned with a fraudulent Supreme Soviet called the European Parliament. When it began planning to launch its own ruble as well, their delight knew no bound. <laughs> they wanted to be in it, and I think they were wrong. I think they've been wrong for years. I think they have made a terrible mistake even by their own lights. This is not a perfect country, never has been, never will be. It now makes shameful conquest of itself, but it has been better both for its own citizens and for the world, that it existed at all. The nation state, in my view, is the largest and best unit in which it is possible to be unselfish to any real effect. To throw it away is to destroy much more than a flag and a name. Without it, and increasingly we are without it, vital things die. Civility, family, morality, language, restraint, kindness. And some months ago, I suffered a nearly Kerstlerian coincidence. I'd spent the day exploring a dismal and hopeless housing estate where almost feral children of 12 and 13 roamed in criminal gangs. My attempt to interview them had ended with one of them hurling a stone with considerable accuracy and force at my head. <laughs> On my way... You see what don't they like? Be, don't you be like that. They know where don't to put the like razor blades that. in the potato. They always did. On, on my way home, I turned off the main road to visit the lonely church near Hardwick Hall where Thomas Hobbes is buried. And as I drove rather gloomily away from this spot, I switched on the car radio to hear a recording of W.H. Auden, who's not on the mobile phone, I take it. <laughs> W.H. Auden reading these lines from The Shield of Achilles, which seemed to me to prophesy the meaningless, history-free, immoral and cultureless wilderness which we have created for ourselves through the abolition of all we have and are. Let me just read them to you. A ragged urchin, aimless and alone, loitered in that vacancy. A bird flew up to safety from his well-aimed stone. That girls are raped, but two boys, knife a third, were axioms to him who'd never heard of any world where promises are kept or one could weep because another wept. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Really. I wouldn't have you. Chris Levitt. Um, my dear chap, um, I, you have not succeeded in making me uh, proud to be British because I've been quite 
proud enough of being English all along. But you have succeeded in making me reasonably proud to be a uh, Hitchens, at any rate. <laughs> Nonetheless, it's my task to depose you here and cross-examine a little. And I want to ask you first, uh, because I know and you've just proved that you choose your words with care and value the language. You say we're met here in Conway Hall, which is named for Moncure Conway, uh, the great secularist and rationalist who wrote the finest biography of the great Thomas Paine, who started the revolution that we're still continuing, um, not against the Hanoverians exactly, but against some of their habits of mind and assumptions of rule, trying to re-export the ideas of Paine back from the United States, where I think no one would deny that they planted the um, real possibility of a constitutional republic. And in your book you say, and I'm proud to be in this hall, in, uh, in a hall named for him. Um, I've been to many dreadful sectarian evenings in this hall in my time. <laughs> Came to have a punch up with the fellow travelers at the Ho Chi Minh Memorial Meeting, if you want to know how much, <laughs> if you want to know how far back all this extends. But um, you, on page 155, I direct you to, you describe in the, in the tones of, in which Evelyn Ward describes the high, insolent dome of Brideshead. And by the way, Mr. Ward noticed children with faces of ageless evil, even in scoop. Are you going to make this question? The, yes, I am, which showed that, the, which showed that the, the discovery of juvenile delinquency... It's a weather forecast in a minute. He has to hurry juvenile, up. Which, I think might show that the discovery of juvenile delinquency is not, is not a new one. But you say of our great national institutions, great fortresses that withstood Tom Paine and the Luftwaffe. Would you now want to take that back? No. Then you, would you like to justify it? Yes, I, na na national socialism has the same root as all, as, as all other socialism. Prolonged and stormy applause of the Stalinist. <laughs> There are some places well, where it's good not to get it. It's okay, um, don't worry. <laughs> okay, well, I know when I'm licked, um, up to, at least up to a point. Um, let me ask you another question. Um, I'll make this one quick, or terse, or pungent, as Mr. Humphreys would probably say. Um, at the, I think it's on page 308. I don't actually have the note in front of me now. You say that the, it really was a terrible mistake and, and, uh, that the United States decided to halt um, what you describe as the British, but was in fact an Anglo-French, um, actually cooperating with continental snail and horse-eating types, I might add. Anglo-French-Israeli invasion of Egypt in 1956. You say it was a, a, a terrible thing that that invasion was stopped by General Eisenhower, President Eisenhower. Do you, do you hold to the view that the Suez invasion is the sort of thing for which we should be nostalgic? I don't think many people would say that the Middle East was a better place as a result of the vacuum which resulted from the failure of Suez than uh, it would have been if we hadn't successfully intervened. No. I'm wondering if I'm allowed a supplementary. One more. No, I think I'll let that stay as a, as a statement. Um, <laughs> golly is all I can say. Um, <laughs> well, in that case, you can do your Germany. One more. Um, do you... Do you think it's a, a sort of invasion of privacy or a kind of rape of everything we've ever held dear, or as they used to say in private eye, everything we've held most often? <laughs> um, do you, that uh, citizens, or if you prefer subjects, anyway, residents, legal residents of these islands can now, if thwarted in a search for justice or redress here, take their case to the European Court of Human Rights and overturn a British denial of that. I think it's very peculiar that people should expect better justice from a court made up in, in many cases of retreads from, uh, from communist yeah. Eastern European regimes than they would in their own courts, yeah. That'll do it. Your turn. Well, then I think I can, well, yeah, that also means, uh, I might add, ladies and gentlemen, comrades, friends, brothers and sisters, that I can be brief um, in my rebuttal uh, because I think, I, I think those were clarifying answers. Uh, I think you'll agree. Um, when I um, had a debate down the road at the Central Hall, Westminster, a few years ago with Alan Clark, the late Alan Clark, who Peter hopes to uh, replace in Parliament, and my, I must say I wish him well. I, hope, I think that 
Kensington and Chelsea Conservatives would be mad to pick anyone else if they want to put the fear of the risen Christ into the Blairites. Um, I think that's an endorsement. And everybody I'm not knows, sure there are many of them here. Though, everybody, right? knows, everybody knows why they wouldn't be frightened of Portillo and everyone uh, can, can see it. Uh, anyway, uh, I finished my debate with... Uh, I was astounded by what Clark said, I must say. Um, and the way he talked and what he seemed to look forward to. Um, this was about five, six years ago. And I, I ended my own peroration in rebuttal by saying that what Alan Clark seemed to beckon forth for what remained of Eucania, because our country, as you know, doesn't have a name yet, which is one of the reasons why it's not quite a nation and not quite a state and not quite a community either, but United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is not the name for a country. It's the name of a, an expired political compromise. And those of us who are quite happy to think of ourselves as English or Englishmen abroad, uh, in saying that manifests, I think, um, a certain confidence rather than the lack of confidence that appears to be offered in the reaffirmations of John Bullishness that are now uh, being peddled to us. So it looked to me as if um, the Clark future would be, for these islands, would be that of a sort of resentful, morose, offshore Serbia. The sort of country that resented interference in its internal affairs, if you remember the expression. The sort of country that had a, a romantic and disordered attitude to its own past and a horrific suspicion of paranoia about its own neighbors and indeed even about some of those who live within its borders. Um, the, the evocation of Serbia wasn't as toxic then um, as it's become since. I mean, I was more right than I knew about what Serbia's dwelling on its past glories would lead to. So I was, that, uh, I was still very impressed as we went down the steps of Central Hall. Alan Clark did that thing he, he can do and I can't, putting the hands behind the back and sort of naturally falling into step with you. It's a military trick, I think, that I don't possess. Um, and putting his head down and saying, also, another gift he had of speaking quite firmly to you without anyone else being able to hear. He said, um, rather clever of you to have spotted the Serbia uh, analogy, he said. Uh, a lot of us chaps um, rather admire Johnny Serb. At least he knows. <laughs> At least he knows what he stands for. He's prepared to stick up for it. Well, I'm not going to say where I think all that has led or could lead, and I don't think with an audience like this, I have to. I of course must ask myself. I'm obliged to ask. Could it be the clerk he was joking, or was it another case of a true word spoken in jest? Um, this is the kind of speculation that Peter spares one. You know he means it. There isn't any of that, uh, there isn't any of that uh, carry on with him. Now, I've not come here, as I hope those of you who've known me for a bit will, will uh, trust, uh, to offer any counsel of complacency. Don't believe in counsels of complacency. But I have, a, I have a short list of things that have never worried me in the least. Uh, it's never worried me in the least that the Conservative Party is not reactionary enough. I've never lost a wink on that. <laughs> it's, it doesn't bother me. I've never worried at all that I'm going to wake up and find the Labour Party has become too radical. <laughs> Just not worth the time. In fact, I would say the Labour Party was now the Conservative Party at prayer. <laughs> in fact, in fact, I don't think there's ever been a better time to be a reactionary in this country. I think there's an almost positive ingratitude in some of Peter's uh, allocutions. It's never bothered me. I've never thought, my God, is the monarchy going to become too populistic and democratic? <laughs> it's never worried me. I've never thought, geez, is the Church of England uh, absurd enough yet? <laughs> And for the reasons I just gave, because I feel the confidence that all Englishmen are born with, even if they come from parents or a parentage that's partly uh, non-English and refugee, uh, never really bothered me that the, that the name, the Ukrainian name, the, the compromise name, the name of a historic compromise, an exhaustive historic compromise, might become a bit more disunited. I feel I can live with that. I have friends who are known Welshmen. Um, <laughs> the odd Scot. Steady on that. I know, I know. And, you know, I, the other thing, I've never since the first time I tried to fight my way to Paris that I thought, this channel should be a lot wider. <laughs> it's too bloody narrow the way it is now. Uh, none of these things bother me in the least. But, and what 
therefore may disqualify me from even being here, because one should have a natural sympathy, one should be able to put the other side's case in theory, as one used to do in the Union and so forth, as a duty. One should be able to phrase their case as well as possible, as if it was one's own. There are bits of this that I just don't get. Um, my, I've got many disagreements with Peter, as I hope I've delineated and will continue to delineate, but the chief one is this. He writes, and his book is very good, I think, and I agree with very much of what he says about the junk culture of the country and the spread of trashiness and showbiz values and so forth. And his chapters on that are the best, though, if challenged, I have some corrections for him about <laughs> Philip Larkin, D.H. Lawrence, and Seller and Yeatman's 1066 and all that. But these can be the mistakes of haste. He's right about a lot of that. But he writes as if it's all been very sudden and very brutal and very abrupt, as if one morning we woke to find that thieves in the night had taken our, our nationhood and our freedoms away from us, as if this crisis was of very recent provenance. Now, it seems to me that almost everything that's happening now, that's being debated now, is long bloody overdue and has been allowed to rot and decay as an argument, as it has been stalled and uh, congested for far too long. It was my current affairs master at my prep school who first asked me whether I thought that Harold Macmillan should or should not agree to join the, what was then the European Common Market, was then called, having evolved from the coal and steel agreement between France and Germany. People now ask you this with, with a sort of nursery freshness, as if, you know, could, could one get on better terms with the immediate continental neighbors. As for the constitutional questions, it, it astounds me, even looking back over my own political life, how little time the left used to spend on looking at what was obvious in the constitutional impasse. Uh, it was obvious in Macmillan's time that there was in this country what I think one could, that would involve borrowing a foreign phrase, describe as an ancien regime. And that this, the existence of this regime and its unexamined reserve strength, unelected, unaccountable powers was what prevented many people from even discussing what might be the matter. Um, an institutional sclerosis, in fact. Though I apologize to any sclerotics uh, who may be present. <laughs> now, the chief interest of Peter's book, and I would say its chief merit, is its extreme candor, therefore, about Thatcherism. Some hardened old comrades will recognize what I mean when I say the Nairn Anderson theses. <laughs> Right, about the long crisis of the British state and establishment. It was quite clear to some of us on the left that if the Labour Party refused to take on the institutional crisis of the Ancien Regime, that someone, it wouldn't, it wouldn't just remain unsolved, there wouldn't be stasis, someone would arise to take it up and break it. And of course that was Mrs. Thatcher. Call her Baroness as much as you like, she'll always be Mrs. Thatcher to me. <laughs> and she, was willing to quarrel, as you'll remember, willing to quarrel as no Labour Prime Minister ever was, with the House of Lords, with the Inns of Court, with the syndics of Oxford University, with the Church of England, with the Bank of England, and above all with the consensus that existed between British capitalism and the barons of the trade union hierarchy. All these institutions that Labour had left untouched in a kind of holy awe. You can't go there, you can't mention any of that, that's all off limits, like the Labour Chancellor, Philip Snowden, I believe it was, in the 1930s, who when asked after the collapse, why didn't you devalue the pound? He said, well, no one told us we were allowed to do that. <laughs> um, not only that, but Mrs. Thatcher, within a, a two months of being elected Prime Minister, had settled the question of the independence of Rhodesia, southern Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, and within not many months after that had signed the Hillsborough Agreement, which in effect ceded the, the crucial point of sovereignty in Northern Ireland. Up until then, the absurd position of Enoch Powell, that the Republic of Ireland had no more right to be consulted about the six counties than Belgium did, which was his stated view, uh, another, another case where his reason drove him mad, was the official view. She dumped it. This was, uh, no Labour Foreign Secretary or Home Secretary would have touched these things in that way. So it's very honest of Peter to say, that the real problem is Thatcherism, because if you are really a, he gives up the honorable title of conservative. He even repudiates the, I think, dishonorable title of Tory. He wants the mantle of reaction. And if you're a real reactionary, you do have to say that Thatcherism is the problem. And that Evelyn Waugh was right, 
and that the real disgrace is the clock hasn't been turned back. My only difficulty with that, not my only one, my main one, the one I'll settle on, is not so much the, whether, we, whether we should argue about whether it should be turned back or whether it could. I just simply believe that it can't. But the revolutionary element in Thatcherism, its confrontation with the Ancien Regime, in other words, is still the hinge event of our politics. And now the reactionaries are faced with the consequences of a Tory revolution, which they know they can't blame on political correctness. Now, it seems to me as plain as day that the old Toryism, the, the Toryism of, that was the summar of which was the status quo in Northern Ireland and Southern Rhodesia, in both of which I spent considerable amounts of time, is irretrievably over and dead by its own hand. Isn't it also plain that the remaining institutional integuments of which those were extrusions, uh, the monarchy, the Privy Council, which I still believe as a small reform could at least decently be called the secret council if we're going to speak English and honor our native tongue. Just call it the secret council and see what happens to your perspective. Hopefully. The Privy Council, the Lords, and the confinement of Scottish and Welsh and Irish affairs to grand committees or to police control are dysfunctional. They just don't work anymore from the establishment point of view. They've simply, as Americans would say, ceased delivery. They don't, they don't fucking work and haven't for a long time. And as the founder of Charter 88, I'm glad to see some signatories of that, I mean, one of the original signatories here, uh, I've thought that that's been obvious to a lot of people for a long while. The partition of Ireland, for example, as, as with the other British imperial partitions of the subcontinent of Palestine and of Cyprus, has had nothing but calamitous and sectarian effects, and as with all these partitions, will lead either to another partition or another war, or both. Uh, and the sooner that this difficulty can be adjusted, the better. And who is to say that this has suddenly been sprung upon us by a conspiracy within the establishment. Who is really going to say that the contrary is not true? That we've been putting off this question and many others for far too long and are now living with the consequences of that promiscuous, idiotic, institutionally conditioned, ancien regime procrastinations. I'm approaching, I know you're, well, I know what you're thinking anyway. Um, now these changes, <coughs> institutional and social ones, need some delicate management because they are capable of setting people against one another and of arousing jealousy and resentment and so forth. They need, in other words, careful handling. Uh, we don't want borders to be redrawn between Wales and England or Scotland and England. And we don't, it's nice to take water for a change. Um, <laughs> and we don't, um, and we don't want, of course, a redrawing of the jagged boundaries that partition not just Ireland but Ulster. As, as Punjab and um, Kashmir and Bengal had to be partitioned to partition the subcontinent, uh, double partitions. It, there needs to be a form in which the centripetal and the centrifugal can be carefully handled. It's also seemed to me for a long time to be self-evident that the form, the political context in which that can take place, must be European. Because where is the solvent? Where was the real solvent of the border question? between Britain and Ireland if it was not the fact that both Britain and the Republic of Ireland became members of the same customs union. At once the border began to look absurd and has become to look more absurd ever since. Why is it that Scottish and Welsh forces can ask for independence and for autonomy now, knowing that they can deal with Brussels as well as London? Uh, how else could it have been? Uh, that's the only way, in other words, that it wouldn't be mere nationalism. It is the European context that has prevented uh, the Catalan and Basque questions in Spain from becoming tribal and prevent and stop them from being as tribal as they were because there is a context in which there's another court as there is even for us humble subjects to, if denied justice we can go to a court in, in Europe of the kind that Peter slandered. So that if, the, to me the political question is the crucial one about Europe, Europe, the, Europe the, the centripetal centrifugal balance, the two, allowed Greece, Portugal, and Spain in my lifetime to, with confidence, get rid of their dictatorships, knowing that, knowing as all intelligent citizens in those countries did, they would never be allowed into the European family if it were not uh, for the, well, if it were not, if they, if they retained their, their dictatorial or despotic mode of government, the, 
the rules of the community forbid the admission of dictatorships or any but parliamentary democracies. It is also this that prevents Hungary and Romania from, uh, from contesting Transylvania now. Both of them want to be members of the European Union. They will not be allowed to import a tribal quarrel in, into the European Union. They are on good behavior for that reason. There is even a possibility that the filthy consequences of British policy in Cyprus can be undone by, the, by a careful European handling of Greek-Turkish relations. And what does the right wing say? We don't want to do business with foreigners. We don't want them interfering in our internal affairs. We reserve the right to say to the extraordinarily sober and disciplined and decent and conscientious political class in Germany, we don't know how lucky we are to be dealing with such people. We reserve the right, we reserve the right to, to daily visit upon them the crudest and most vulgar and hateful insults. And we reserve the right, as Mrs. Thatcher did the other day, to reward their patience and Europeanism, a country that openly says we want a Europeanized Germany, not a Germanized Europe. We want to enlarge Europe, so to speak, to restrain ourselves, to contain ourselves and our history, to speak of them in the most spiteful and nauseating terms, and to, and to say that only English-speaking countries have played a civilized role in Europe in this century. Where does this arrogance come from? Where does this, how is this demagogy permitted? This is the British version of fascism. I think there must be many people living in Holland now and Belgium. Well, I'll just say this, John. And maybe very many people living in Holland and Belgium still to this day <clears throat> who could have done without the Anglo-German naval agreement of 1934, which allowed the Nazis to build a gigantic fleet and encouraged, and encouraged their own rearmament. I think there is a hideous I make the direct allegation that there is a hideous, vicarious superego at work in the minds of the late Alan Clark, who after all a tremendous Germanophile, of the Tory historians like Charmley and the others who have a secret admiration actually for the Germany that uh, Britain defeated. Um, and they're venting this uh, buried and disgusting memory of, their, of the behavior of their own party and their own class now in an attempt uh, at, just, at reviving the cheapest form of xenophobia and chauvinism. And I would really feel awful if any member of any uh, branch of our family had anything to do with anything like any of that, okay? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, first of all, a small point about the name of the country. Uh, it seems to me to do us some credit that we call ourselves the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Were we some other countries I could think of, we might uh, not call ourselves the uh, United, um, United uh, what shall I say, um, Reich of um, Germany and Western Poland, or perhaps the United Reich of Germany and Northeastern France, or the United Reich of Germany and Austria, or the United Reich. Have I left anywhere out? <laughs> they never well, yes. troubled. Yes, they so never troubled. Yeah. They never troubled with such nonsense. It was always the Gross Deutsche Reich, and that was it. The reason why we call ourselves that name is we are a mul There is nothing. Why is it that you appear obsessed with the doings of the Privy Council, a body which has vestigial. that it can actually call itself the secret council and nobody noticed because it's in, so to speak, Norman French. That's all I was talking about. Now, there are lots of outfits that I'm not, whose deliberations I'm not allowed to vigilate or attend. Or no, the Bank of England uh, governors is one. The European uh, Commission is certainly another. BBC Board of the, Governors. The Board of BBC Board of Governors would be another. The, the B, um, and, of, of course, of the Board of No Multinational Corporation will admit me to take its minutes. So yes, but what they're, they're, I'm they're, interested, you're, you're missing the point. They're all under to, the scrutiny. They're all under the scrutiny of a parliament which you can elect and dismiss. The European Commission is not. Actually, well, then it is the matter of whether you'd scrutinise whether you'd scrutinise parliament by a select committee. But these are there is a European Parliament, which is, which <laughs> it is true. No, wait, wait. Is, uh, is, uh, there, there were times when this Parliament of ours had not uh, gathered to itself the powers of, to invigilate. The, the absolutist rulers of this country, um, and it's certainly true, it seems to me, it's commonplace on the left to say 
that the European Parliament must acquire and take unto itself powers of this sort and, and mount a, a struggle of that kind. But it is on that terrain that the struggle will take place. And you, right. want, to, you want to move it back across the... Right, right. Another, under the, um, another question, Bill. No, just one other. Uh, you, you said you never wished the channel to be wider. Wouldn't you have preferred it to be wider in 1940 than it was? No. <laughs> Absolutely not. I mean, well, for two reasons. One is it's now, I think, been conclusively shown that there was never going to be an invasion. None was meditated. Um, and the other is that if there was going to be one, um, you, I think you quote um, the man who uh, reassured the Parliament about the Bonaparte. He said, I do not say, my lords, that they cannot come. I, I say only that they cannot come by sea. Well, that wasn't, that wasn't the way they were going to come. There was, there, was, there was no other explanation for the, uh, and for the thing. And all, all the new work on that period shows that there was no plan for it either. What, 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 what so, no, one I'm one sorry, I'm not going to turn into Vera Lynn even to please you. <laughs> That's a great relief, I have to say. Uh, one more quick one. Okay, what, one, one quick one. On the, on the Irish question, you, you, you say that the, 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 the joining of what you call a customs union by both countries uh, made the border irrelevant. Isn't it rather odd that the border wasn't fairly irrelevant already, given that the two countries actually have effectively a common citizenship in which both can live and work and vote in each other's, in each other's countries and for each other's parliamentary elections, and passports are not required for travel between them? Surely the issue is much more that the European Union sought to interfere in the relationship between two sovereign countries. Um, no, I would say not. You're, you're right to add that there were, there were already solvent effects on the border. Uh, that there, and you would, be, you would have been right if you'd said the border was an absurdity, an impossibility in the first place, and was, and was drawn only for sectarian reasons, which shame those forces of the crown that did it, that committed it. Uh, but no, I, it, it seems to me, looking back on the, the way that the, the absurdity of the situation in Ulster became manifest, was about the time that the Republic of Ireland era, the Free State, whichever you want to call it, became a member also of the, of the European, then, of the EC. Um, the fact is that the, these are prefigurations uh, that you mentioned. We, we hope soon, we hope devoutly that very soon it will be possible for all Europeans to have that same relationship. As for interference, no, somebody had to help save the British from the Enoch Powell view that no one had any right to discuss the six counties but the Privy Council, that no one had any right to discuss it um, who was even Irish, um, particularly. Uh, if they were Irish, and that it was interference in our internal affairs to mention it, because there was the Serbianization of the question staring one directly in the face. And right. We should be grateful to those in Europe and in the United States who saved the British government from its own folly in Ulster. Right, thank you. Questions from, uh, from you, yes. Uh, uh, can we, incidentally, if they're going to be speeches, make them very, very, very short speeches? I mean, preferably no speeches, but if you have to make a speech, make it a short one. Yeah, back there. did an interview on the subject last Sunday afternoon at 12.45, so there we are. If you'd watched that instead of reading your documents, you'd have known, but there we are. Off you go. Peak, peak time is over for the peak important time, subject. Precise. I've, peak time for the I, people. I, must, I think it's an absolutely corking question. Uh, <laughs> and, and I would like to, I would sincerely like to see the documentation of that. And I have some people I'd want to show it to. to. All right. But it's so far, it does come as news to me. Right. Yep. Yeah. Didn't get the first sentence. Uh, why is it, well, does it appear to be necessary to refer to the religion of the person involved in whatever happens to be happening at the time? 
Well, I, that's a, a, a simple journalistic point. This is a, 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 a war of nationalities, and by identifying the, the religion, if you like, of the victim, you identify nationality. It has no other significance. It happens. It's surely much more important uh, that the killing has taken place than the way it's described. Yeah. Works for me. Yeah, absolutely. On, on either side. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure, I mean, what I'm sure of is that many more atheists and agnostics have been killed in this conflict and written down in a sectarian form uh, than are, than are uh, ever going to be acknowledged. Well, the it's not unlike the, uh, the same, oh, no, it's actually, that is part of the, of the constitutional settlement there. You can only be referred to as loyalist or so on in ways that identify you religiously. Just as the, uh, the British Constitution for Cyprus said you could only be defined as a citizen as Muslim or non-Muslim, all right? So the sectarianism is in the institutional arrangement, that's all I would say, and is endemic to partition, which was a headcount of that kind. Otherwise, they would have taken the whole of Ulster, which, as you know, sir, is nine counties. But that, in that case, there would have been too many what they call tags, which is another name for Catholic. So, yeah. uh, let's not forget that the sectarianism is the, is the warp and the woof of the thing and, and has state support. Down here, and then back there, and then over there. Yeah. How can you equate your enthusiasm for democracy in Europe and for democracy generally, um, this is to Christopher Hitchens, um, when uh, Romano Prodi told our distinguished chairman in an interview on On the Record that the unelected commissioners in, of Europe would become the government of Europe? And the second part of the question to Peter is how can you equate your enthusiasm for William Hague when William Hague is still a member of the London Europe Society, which is a pro-European federalist group, and he has never actually said that we will abolish, keep the pound forever. I don't quite see where your Toryism fits in with William Hague. Can I deal with that quickly, yeah, so Chris, on, Christopher can do so? I, I, I want to know how much enthusiasm as, William Hague you have. As an old-fashioned Anglican, I don't have enthusiasm for anything. <laughs> uh, it's not allowed. You're not dismayed by your leaders or your, I'll tell you, perhaps your leaders' um, views. I only ever admire actions, not people. It's much safer that way. They, people always disappoint you. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, there was a question back there, yeah. Um, yes, I just wanted to, to say that um, I, I'm a Francophile myself. And oh, in the NHS... <clears throat> That's not yet. Hang on, I'm sorry, I do beg you, but let oh. me interrupt you a second. I forgot that it was a two-part question. Oh. And, and, and the first part of that question, which was addressed to Peter, was about Romano Prodi saying yeah. that uh, he, he yeah. regards uh, the Commission as being the government of Europe. And it's absolutely true that he does refer to the Commission, uh, the Commissioners as being the government of Europe. No, it's a horrendous question. I just didn't want to seem as if I was dodging it. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not going to answer it anyway? No, 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 of course I, I mean, and it has traces even of scepticism in it, though. It reminds me of people who would say to you during the Cold War, don't you realise that only the other day the General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union openly said that in 20 years they'd have conquered the whole of Western Europe. You know, they, here we have the documents and so on. I think it sounds like a vain remark made by a rather vapid person to me. I mean, what's the status of his claim? How could he enforce he's it? He's the president of the, the point is, If there are, the point is, but if there are, he's the, he's the, he's the temporary, he's the, pre, he's the president, present, he's the present uh, locum tenens of the thing. He won't be there for very long, as you know, for the rotation, but it, I've already said, and I don't mind, and How believe me, I don't mind hearing myself say something again, but I won't be accused of repetition if it's forced on me, that yes, there is going to be a big argument in Europe, as there will continue to be in this country either way, about who's in charge and whether we live democratically or not. But I believe that the future terrain of this argument is European. And it's neither won nor lost by the accession or the departure of one country or another. How complacent the radical left always become when the threats to democracy and liberty come from the left. Who asked you? <laughs> I didn't wait. It's, it's extraordinary, isn't it? The, 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 all this fire is directed against, uh, against the British throne, a body which actually has far too little power, and nothing against the institutions of the, of, of the European Union. And also, I have to say this week, that the, the, the actions of two bodies, one, the Law Commission, in deciding that it was going to begin the abolition of the rule against double jeopardy so the government can 
prosecutes you the, as many times as it likes if it doesn't like the verdict. And secondly, the actions of the Labour Party in suppressing its own internal democracy so that Ken Livingston cannot conceivably be its candidate for mayor without serious protest from the left who set themselves up as the apostles of freedom. I don't, think that's, I don't think it's fair to say that. And they won't, can. they won't, and the people who will do this to a political party will do it to a country too, believe me. No, Anthony, are you going to sit here, are you going to sit still for that? Can I just say? You could invite you know, Anthony to speak I if think, you would. I thought, I mean, I, I recognise someone in the audience who is better able to give the lie to that than I am. And I'm a power sharer, so. Anthony, want to speak? Yeah, let's get a microphone to Anthony here. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Um, can, you, can you, sorry, forgive me, I'm going to come to you, I promise, but since the question has been raised about, uh, about democracy... Well, anyway, Labour, on the Livingston thing, Labour I can Party. say, on the Livingston thing, I can say for myself that everyone I know on the left thinks that Labour, the, the Labour Party internal democracy is a tautology. <laughs> they still vote for them. And always has been, by the way. No. And, well, uh, um, I, I think in terms is this, is this on? Yeah. Um, yeah. The issue in, in, in terms of the British Constitution and the way in which the present government in particular is simply has, has inherited a framework hollowed out by Thatcherism and is now basically has made it is, is, is sort of levelling, whether it's the House of Lords, whether what you're saying, the way in which they're proceeding over double jeopardy. Uh, I mean, obviously, these are outrages. And the idea that the left is sort of sitting there quietly trying not to protest about this is, is a grotesque caricature. And, and, and so far as what the government, I mean, I write to somebody who, you know, protested as loudly as I could over what has happened in Wales. And I can't believe that they have taken Wales to be such a triumph uh, uh, that they're now going to try and impose it on Londoners. But I think that the, it, there is even a chance, the irony of the situation, is that well, I've heard Blair standing, I mean, manifestly kind of realizing that he was sort of trying to pull a fast one, saying, I was elected on an electoral college. This is Omov. And in fact, I think you'll see that, 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 that um, as when Omov was put through for the voting of the Labour leadership by John Smith, it meant that the trade union members actually voted as individuals and their votes were then dispersed according to how they vote. Now they've put through this commission. This, this new electoral college, but in fact the trade unions will vote as block votes. So if a small majority of trade, of trade union members of the TNG are going to ballot, vote for Livingston, the entire TNG block vote will have to be put in his direction. So even that could backfire. But the idea that the left is sort of sitting there saying, oh, this is a wonderful thing, this is, this is a ridiculous uh, caricature. Could I? You'll, could you'll, I... You'll, you'll join me in the campaign to make sure these people don't become the government again after the next election then. <laughs> well, uh, Can we take that as a rhetorical the, the, question? The question of yeah. an election, if you ask me, is always, one is always forced in terms of election within a choice between the alternatives. But, the, the, um, uh, uh, but I, I think that we have seen an absolutely tragic loss of a great and historic moment for democracy in this country, which happened in 97. And I think the way in which the government is exploiting the inheritance of Thatcherism, which is a sort of ram through procedure from the center, is a great tragedy. And it's one which will actually have, in long term, quite catastrophic consequences for it. But can I just take right, this you. one? Can I ask a question? Well, no, 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 because or... I, I promised that the woman at the huh? back there that uh, she was going to have a question. Can I do it later? Uh, you can certainly do it later. But, but I promised that woman and then somebody, somebody over there uh, at the, in the back row. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to say that, uh, like Peter, I, I'm a Europhile and a uh, neonative French speaker, but, but do have severe reservations about further European integration um, from the point of view of the democratic deficit. And I wondered whether Christopher, Chris was at all concerned about uh, the extension of qualified majority voting, for example, and the, the, the fact that, 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 that then, um, you know, the commission isn't, isn't elected it's appointed and, and that there and I think the other thing I would like to mention something that Voltaire said um, oh, a great anglophile and, and he right. said something to the effect that um, I disagree with what you say but I would defend to the death your right to say it and I, I feel that sometimes people that want to present the other point of view as regards uh, in European integration are, are not being given an opportunity no. to present that viewpoint Yep. But the question Good. about whether you're concerned about, you know, the democratic deficit. Well, on, the, on what you say is the approximation of Voltaire, I believe, you, I believe you have it in translation exactly right. 
that he did say he would defend to the death someone's right to say something with which he disagreed. I find increasingly that I can't defend to the death the right of people to ask me a question that I've already answered three times. <laughs> I'll defend it if you, I'll, I will of course defend it, but with some weariness, ma'am, I've already answered that question. I've said there will be a struggle for democracy within Europe. I can see it coming. It's already underway. It's a non sequitur to say that because there are undemocratic institutions in Europe, one should withdraw to the Serbian position under the protection of the monarchy, the Privy Council, and the Bank of England. Now, is, is that plain, or, can, or do you want me to find another way of saying it? I right. think it's a boring question. Right, he is, uh, he's, he's answered it. Yeah, right at the back, uh, yeah. yeah. Boring question, uh, should we just allow? Uh, first, the Commission is the government of Europe. Sorry, say again. The, the Commission is the government of Europe in the sense that it's a civil service. It doesn't actually take any decisions. It only implements the decisions taken by the Council of Ministers, oh, which is, in fact, elected by the people of Europe. So there's a misconception going on. But my question is, I just, it's more of a, a request for a clarification from Peter. Um, as I understood it, correct me if I'm wrong, you said that one of the good things about the United Kingdom of Great Britain and, I, and Northern Ireland was that it was a collection of nation states. Presumably, those nation states came together for the, because they believed that they would do better cooperating and being together than they would if they were apart. If that was good enough for England, Wales, and Scotland hundreds of years ago, why, why is it wrong for the nation states of Europe to do the same thing now? And crucially, why do you think that it's acceptable for nation states to do it when it comes to comprising the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, but not acceptable for them to do it at all in terms of Europe? Uh, very simply, uh, Derek and I used to spend every Sunday morning arguing about this, and um, I'm happy to continue. That's Derek Draper, by the way, in case you didn't know him, it's Derek Draper. Very, very, very simply, uh, the, the existence of a... Oh, you, you knew how you sounded. I didn't mean to do Oh, come yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Fuck off. If you knew how you sounded when you did that, you would not do it. You sound like morons. Give it up. Stop that. Stop it. No. I think anyone who does that should be flung out. Don't do it. Fair enough. Yes. Um, it you like how you sound. It's a, matter of, it's a matter of practicability. Common culture and common language make it possible. And it's also a matter of scale. There are limits with, beyond which it cannot be done. The United States has only achieved its size by an immensely rigorous policy of ensuring that all immigrants to the United States become American, a policy which I have to say is now breaking down to the great, uh, the, the great detriment of, of, of the United States. But you cannot do it unless there is something which everybody shares as well as things which also divide them. It, it, all we would have in Europe is a mass of nations more divided by what's separated them than united by what held them together. And it would not, could not work as a nation. It might work as an empire, uh, a similar empire to the Soviet one, but it certainly wouldn't work as a nation. Right, there's a question right at the very back there and then to, sorry, it's not desperately easy to see with the lights. So if you're up at the back there, it's quite difficult to see, but there is somebody up there I know who wants to ask a question. I dare say you'll be able to shout because only if you've got any mics up there. Oh, and somebody there as well. All right, let's have yours first and then we'll uh, get a microphone here. Uh, can I say how wonderful it is to see the Montagues and Capulets in one family? Um, I, um, I, a great exercise, if I may say, in, uh, in, in sibling egoism. But let me come back to the basic question. Uh, and this would be, surely, uh, that is it not a sign, I ask both uh, brothers Karamazov this, um, is it not a sign of the great sophistication of this nation that we are gradually seeing a dissolution of the concept of nationalism. You talk, Peter, as if we've given up patriotism. I think that's a good thing, don't you? No. <laughs> you want to be as brief? You know your literary family values, all right. And I love the Capulet bit, and I love the Karamazov bit, too. But yes, I really do think it's a good thing. Uh, that, that nationalism and patriotism are in decline, sure. Yeah. Right, uh, there was a question, yeah, there. And then, yes, Anthony, I, know a lot I of said Serbs, that. I know a lot of Serbs who think the same. 
and wish it so had, and what? It, and wish hmm? it had come in time for them. Well, I mean, you don't have so to, what? You don't have to care about them because I mean, they're foreign. There's only one sovereign country on the globe. Is it called Serbia? Are there no others? <laughs> not mention any others. Do they not have different records, yeah, history, yes. and, and yes, like methods that. of behaving? Yes, yes. Bosnia. Bosnia. I'll Try Bosnia. name a country without concentration Bosnia. camps for Bosnia. Bosnia. There are several nation states that have never had concentration camps. Right, thank you. Woman well, down here, second row. Yeah. Yeah, it's on. Just hold it fairly close. Yeah. Clark's choice, not mine. Yeah, it's on. Just talk and hold it as close and talk. If, yeah, if it's voice can. activated. Yeah. <laughs> or not yeah, as the case it. may be. Come on, let's get it. All right, what do you think of the treacherous stories first, uh, Peter? Well, I, I mean, I think, uh, I, a couple, of, that is a couple of weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago in Blackpool, I, I actually presented a Labour Party membership application form, which I taken some trouble to obtain uh, to, <laughs> to, 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 to Mr. to Mr. Kenneth Clark. I would have given one. I, I would have given one to Michael Heseltine if I could have found him, but he, I, I, I think he was probably at Downing Street at the time. And, and, and Mr. Christopher Patton was too busy uh, disbanding the Royal Ulster Constabulary to be found. But if I, if I could, I would ask them all to go to the party where they belong, the anti-British party, in which they would be much happier. Christopher. Christ, it's like green mantle, isn't it? I mean, uh, real, there's bit? a real buck and growl uh, under there. I like it, I'm in a way I admire it, in a sense. But um, uh, I'll, I'll confess something to you. The sorts of Tory who... Uh, go on about how um, English blood has, is the only thing that has saved, you know, the wretched mongrel continent. So it made me want to throw up, as I've already said. Did I say that? But no, you didn't. But the sorts of Tory who you, who you are waiting to denounce in your column who do say it make me, and who are of your faction, make me throw up. But they don't make me throw up as much as Michael Heseltine does. <laughs> It's, call, it, call it visceral, call it a prompting from, you know, the, I've always thought, I can't understand it. How did he ever get into Parliament? How did he ever get chosen? How did, you get, how did the next selection committee pick him? How did he get picked for the Cabinet? Why, does, why do people like that and Mandelson and Portillo just keep coming back all the time? Yeah. Where do we find such men? And, and, I'm sure and they I, speak on And you, since Patton right? came up, I, when, when, when Patton said he thought he'd never live to see the day, that Heseltine could be pelted with cocktail sausages and peanuts. <laughs> I thought, well, I didn't think I'd live to see the day either, but since fratricide is our subject, I don't mind fratricide of that sort among the Tories. <laughs> yeah, Anthony, make, make it a short one, please, with um, a lot of people. I just want to first to say that I agree very strongly with Hitch that the great battle for democracy right, is... Make, make it a question, please. Well, the question Thank is something which is about the title, which is about what, what do the two brothers think about the future of Britain? And it seems to me that um, what Peter is saying, if, if you tried to say that if, if what you said became policy, Scotland would leave the United Kingdom. The people of Scotland, who themselves have a nationalism, not a sort of visceral sort of nationalism of the sort, perhaps a Euro, but nonetheless quite a profound and important nationalism, would not accept to remain part of the United Kingdom govern. So are you for that? Is this the kind, you are arguing for the breakup of Britain in right, effect. Right, that's, that's, that's. And that's. so far as, as Hitch is concerned, he said, right, we don't want to redraw the borders. But in effect, how, given the dynamic that's taken place, given what's happened since the, the sort of, what I call the constitutional interruptus of, of Labour's sort of partial devolution, uh, uh, surely that border is being redrawn. Right, uh, uh, Peter, first. Uh, am I for it? No, I am absolutely not for Scotland leaving the United Kingdom, but as a Democrat, I believe that if that's the decision which they make, I, I have to allow it to happen. I would, would do everything in my power to prevent it from happening. My first memories are Scottish. I, 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 that's, that, that's the part of the United Kingdom in which I, I had my first consciousness of being here, and I don't feel that it's a separate country. But if people there wish it to be one, then there's nothing I can do to prevent it. I hugely regret the disgusting use of this government, of the device of the referendum, a device which is banned in one European country, quite rightly and admirably, 
the Federal Republic of Germany because they know, they know what referendums are for. And one of the things they're for is for bullying parliaments and making unrepeatable government actions. So we can't go back on it even if we want to. I regret that. But I think that the, the, the issue is actually going to be decided by whether or not we, we allow ourselves to be bamboozled into joining the euro ruble. If we are, then of course the United Kingdom ceases to exist and Scotland becomes a dependency and vassal of Brussels instead of part of the United Kingdom, as do all the, all the parts of these islands. So it's over. But if we can prevent the euro ruble, then it's possible that we might be, we might be able to rebuild the union again. I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm filled with gloom about the future. I think most things are likely to go wrong. It doesn't mean I want them to go wrong. Right, Christopher. Uh, I, perhaps I should say that um, I wouldn't mind the title of Eurosceptic or, or if it hadn't been so disfigured by these uh, terrible xenophobes. Um, if, for, if, for example, what the gentleman at the back said about double jeopardy and the uh, European law turned out to be absolutely true or could be proved to me to be true, I would change my position. One of the strong <laughs> reasons I've been witnessed... Wait, I'm talking hypothetically. Okay. All right, it's a thought experiment. Do you understand? Um, if that were the case, I would have to revise my opinion because up until now one of my strong Europhile feelings has been that I'd rather face the European Court than the House of Lords if it was a matter of justice. Right? And that's a very strong part of my present case. If that turned out to be all founded, I'd have to rethink it. The same if the way in which various kinds of integration and um, regional questions were addressed were to be crude or um, opportunistic. But I still feel that the terrain of the struggle is a European one, and that, that one should take one stand on that ground. And that, I think that's actually been sufficiently demonstrated. There used to be people on the left, actually, there still are, who's, uh, although it's, it's funny, Peter never stresses them, um, quite a number of them, in fact, who say, well, we don't want anything to do with Europe because it's a club of capitalists. Well, actually, the United Kingdom could be perfectly well described as such a thing if that's what the objection is. So I think one should avoid non sequitur, one should avoid tautology, and one should allow hypotheticals. Right? I think that would clarify debate. At the back there, at the top, and then we'll come down here to the front. Yeah, you've been... Thank you. I'd like to respond to Chris's <coughs> point about uh, Ulster and Ireland. But you'll respond with a question rather than a comment, won't you? Because, yeah. yeah. I certainly wouldn't agree to the analogy, but of course all these things are historically grounded and limited. I just felt that the, those who had partitioned Ulster had, had less right to call themselves the Ulster men than uh, they thought they had. And given that those who have ever looked at the, the least account of the Boundary Commission and how it conducted itself uh, during partition and how it deliberately drew uh, sectarian boundaries, uh, could I think make an honest disagreement with that. I also felt it was worth pointing out to the other victims of, of the uh, British Empire and its partitionist withdrawal and uh, scuttle strategy that these maimings of, of Kashmir and Bengal and Punjab uh, are more than just the separation of India and Pakistan. Other ancient and uh, long existing communities had to be amputated in order to bring this about. And of course now uh, the, the border, the, the, the uh, well-intentioned and uh, uh, noble and civilizing mission the British drew on their withdrawal is the place where a nuclear exchange is likely to take place. Right. Yep. Uh, I just want to ask Christopher whether he associates the United Kingdom with anything greater than some of its parts. The reason I ask that is because it seems to me that you associate yourself with Englishness, Christopher Sargent, and Peter associates himself with Britishness. Now you talk of nationalism with some disdain. Um, but isn't it your friends on the le leftist commentators like yourself uh, who talk of Englishness as petty, as backward, as nationalist, and as ugly, and yet Englishness is associated as tolerant, and as liberal, and as multicultural? 
uh, might be true of some people. I mean, my, my, my reason for my own preference is simply that it's English language and English literature. I, what it can, one, one can utter the claim to an English identity, in other words, without strain. Um, it was, there was no such thing as the English Empire. I mean, the Act of Union, you know, that brought Scotland in was in order to make Scotland complicit with imperialism, right? And there are certain colonies in this world, in that world, um, Malawi is one, uh, specifically Scottish in, in the imperial domain. Um, and one of, my reason, one of the reasons why I used to suspect Scottish nationalism was that it had been a unionist movement and an imperialist movement until, so to speak, the diminishing returns kicked in and they, they felt less like being part of the union. And I still don't like the SNP. Um, I couldn't, I think, be reconciled to it. So, uh, it, 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 there must undoubtedly be, and I believe I've come across evidence of it, ways of being English in a, in, a, in a boring or petty or tribal manner. I have no doubt of it, because I've seen the flag of St. George fluttering over the stricken fields of football matches that I, uh, the outcomes of which don't interest me. <laughs> and never will. But, my yeah. prefer, but the literature is the, um, the literature is the main thing. I proposed when we had our Charter AJA conference on the monarchy that all you need to do, really, when you've scrapped the Windsors, which is, by the, I, I don't, I wonder how many people here would really feel they'd lost anything if uh, we, I mean, I think we, probably most people here could feel now that they could live without it, let's say. It would be possible to outgrow the House of Windsor. But what, would, would, what one should do is just reorient Westminster Abbey. We were, the conference was held opposite the Abbey. Get people to go and visit a rather expanded um, section which would not go under the patronizing and condescending and hideous title of Poet's Corner but would be an expansion of the Abbey to celebrate the national literature. And that would be a good place to bring the children to and to talk about tradition and continuity and history and even some grandeur. Yes. But right at the back, yeah. I think there it's very Irish and Welsh and Scottish oh, people in it too. We've got to this sorry. subject now of Englishness. I want to just pick up on a couple of things um, on that. It's mentioned the Scottish Nationalist Party and I believe Ply Cymru as well. Both independence parties, both pro-Europe. The only independence party that gets any votes in this country, the UK independence party, of course, is Eurosceptic. It tells us something about what we're getting to here. It's a problem, the problem that, that's in your book, Peter. I think it's a problem for the English. But um, I will also a bit disturbed to this chap over here talk about the disappearance of, of nationalism and patriotism. We on the left, those of us here who still think of ourselves in that way, we do have a problem with that. For many, many years, we have promoted the idea of multiculturalism. And what has happened as a result of that is we've become unable to get in touch with our own national identity that we all have. And the problem that we have is that when the referendum for the pound comes, as it one day will do, we will have to deal with these chaps with a little pound sign on their collars, some of whom we've heard who are among us tonight. And that argument that we're going to have with them is going to be about what it means to be English. And, and I think that we, we really need to, and I want to thank Peter for his book, because it, it's the ground that we're going to have to fight this battle on is a ground that Peter and his kind know very, very well. They're absolutely sure about it. Peter, I'm sure, um, right. wrote his book sitting at home. Jeremy Paxman had to go and ask people what it means to be English. We have to again ask ourselves these questions because if we are going to fight these people, and by these people I mean people to whom, so that's, there are some of us to whom 1940, the, the, the 1940s are a very important decade which have many lessons for history which we can learn. But there are some other people like Peter to whom the worldview of 1940 is still true and still exists All and right. still motivates them day to day. The, the point is that we are going to have to, from our own ideas and our own identity, create a sense of Englishness that is inclusive and that is patriotic. Because if we don't, people uh, like Peter uh, will say who is English and who is not English and it will be based on the colour of people's skin. Right, quick, quick one. No, no, just, just deal with that. I know you think you want uh, I, 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 I'm sorry, we, 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 I, I really um, can't actually follow the logic of what you say. We seem to me to have a, 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 perf a perfectly... We seem to have a... Well, I, I wonder if anybody else has the same problem as I do, but, but whether, or not, whether or not they do, we seem to me to have a perfectly tolerant, democratic and free society in existence as we are. Why should anybody want to replace it with anything else unless their motives are malevolent? All right, well, if can't hear you again, Billy. I'm sorry. You, you, you better... I'm going to take one more question, and then we're going to get them to do one minute. The last question, yeah. Guy there, and the, yeah, that's it. And then uh, 
They're each going to do one minute to close. Yeah. My, my uh, question is for Christopher Hitchens. I, I agree with you that a nation is a good thing, but I'm not sure whether, whether the English nation actually exists anymore. Well, um, do you do you do you sort of really 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 think it does? Well, I, I guess that might even lead us to the uh, <laughs> the final minute from each of them, uh, because since we're supposed to be debated, we've gone all over the place. But that's fine. I mean, it's not the not the most simple topic um, abolishing Britain. It does open up rather rather a lot of avenues. Um, I'm going to give them a minute each to uh, to tell us their views uh, as a final thought after all of those questions. I wish we could add more time to questions, but we're already an hour and a half, so there you go. Uh, are you first this time, Christopher? Oh, okay, great, thanks. Um, well, um, anyone who's uh, been, spent as much time in Marxist politics and company as I have, I mean, has learned, well, a, a, a number of self-taught uh, painful lessons, one of which I think certainly would be to beware the use of the word inevitability. Um, in many ways, a very un Marxist concept, but sometimes overused by Marxists. However, it does seem to me to be at least, at the very, very least, arguable and very hard to deny that we're dealing here with long run tendencies that are not the will of uh, some conspiratorial elite or of some uh, easily led mob. The, these are long-term tendencies that have been visible to us for some time and which have been long overdue for a frontal consideration. One of these is that uh, Britain without its empire or commonwealth has to find a new relationship with Europe, that, this, that there, will, there is no crutch of the kind that used to be supplied by the special relationship, the main uh, relic of, of the recent version of which is the love affair between Augusto Pinochet and the Baroness, uh, because that's how they got to know each other, was through the special relationship. And that's how actually partly they were both brought up. Um, that when you've excluded certain alternatives or certain possibilities, some things become inevitable. I think that in parallel with this, or at least no, parallel is another word actually I've learned to distrust from, from the same stable, but uh, comparable to it histor in historical time is a, is a discovery that our, our antique institutions were dysfunctional. I think it's probably a very good coincidence that these two very troubling, and, and to many people I can readily understand, very disturbing things happened at the same time. I think that's a piece of luck, because it means they can be met with and engaged with in some way in synchronicity. But probably the main condition for this, is for it to be discussed intelligently, is to revive what is currently absent from, from English, and British, and national politics. Which is, which is the, the, the X factor, the missing link, the democratic left. And I think without a revival of the democratic left, we're, stuck, we're sunk. Peter. <laughs> Again, I have to appeal to George Orwell, who once described uh, rather well, in advance of it ever happening, New Labour as an assembly of escaped Quakers, uh, vegetarians, uh, birth control fanatics. Uh, Marxists chewing polysyllables and Labour Party backstairs crawlers. <laughs> and I think they were in there too. Yes. Sandal, wear, sandal, sandal wearing, wearing fruit juice sandal drinkers. Wearers. They're now among us. They're now among us in huge numbers, taking over everything in sight and, and, and running the country. And they are not our friends, neither yours nor mine. What he said that well, social, like socialism juice. should be about was, I haven't noticed you liking fruit, is that what he... If it's what, mixed with scotch. What he, what he said socialism should be about was justice and liberty. And these are objectives with which uh, I should think everyone in this room would, dis, would, uh, would profoundly agree. And it isn't about that at the moment. At the moment it's about the accretion of power in Downing Street, the destruction of almost all parts of our independent civil society, and the creation of a culture of baby talk and propaganda rather than serious political debate, which any intelligent person must surely scorn. And yet you vote for it. I don't understand it. You vote for the destruction of the things that you love. You, you, support, you support a party headed, headed by, uh, by an empty vessel who doesn't even understand the speeches that he makes and has to retract them half an hour afterwards because he's discovered <laughs> people don't, don't like them. Who thinks, 
to my own personal knowledge that they speak Brazilian in Brazil. This is the real Dan Quayle we're dealing with here. You support this outrageous, manipulated and manipulating government and you stand aside and say, well, heavens, is there such a thing as corpus juris? Is there actually a threat to habeas corpus? Is there really going to be a European federal police force? Well, yes, there is. And is there a European commission which doesn't actually have any, any, any responsibility to any parliament? Well, yes, there is. And is the European parliament, the European parliament going to restrain it? Of course it's not. Just go and examine the thing. It is a supreme Soviet. And you sit there and you support things which are inimical to everything that you believe in. And what's more, while you're doing it, while you're doing it, you, 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 you support the, the demolition of, of civil behaviour, you support the demolition of the married family, of the education system, which the left in this country can hang its head in shame for having demolished systematically through the actions mainly of Anthony Crossland, who swore that he would close down every Oops. bleeping grammar school in the country. All these things you do, and you look at the consequences, and you say, let's have some more of this. How can you possibly want it? Nobody in this room should want to abolish Britain. It has been a friend to all of us and to many other people in the world. It is not Serbia or anything remotely resembling it. We shouldn't denigrate ourselves. We should learn to be proud of what is good about this country and to set about putting right what is bad, not sinking into, a, in, in, into the sea, giggling over the Millennium Dome. <laughs> right. It would... It would be... Uh, no, here we go. It would be very, it would be very, it would be very silly to have a vote, bearing in mind that I suspect most of you had a fairly clear idea of how you felt when you came into this room. But I, no, I won't have a vote. I'll ask if anybody who's changed their minds during the course of the debate, put your hand up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll have a vote. Who wants to abolish Britain? <laughs> <laughs> All right, who doesn't? You see? There they are. Hands up. Who doesn't want to abolish Britain? Who thinks it's a stupid motion? Who thinks it's a stupid motion? <laughs> but it's still been fun. Thank you all very much indeed, and thanks to them.